So, last time we discovered the Higgs. Congratulations, everyone. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions about the process, about any of the subtleties, about any of the things I said last time? Um, certainly a lot of levels at which one can think about this rather amazing fact that there is a Higgs boson in the world we know. Maybe, let me make a couple of comments, maybe about this first question. So, this is the, again, the current situation as far as the uh, two experiments, both of which have measured Higgs to gamma gamma and Higgs goes to four leptons. Uh, and again, this is the mass that they extract from the position of the resonance and the signal strength relative to a Higgs boson corresponding to that mass. And notice that the signal strength therefore depends on what mass you've got. Words, if you, it's not, sure, not merely the number of events, because the number of events you would get for Higgs goes to Z to Z depends on whether the Higgs is at 124 or 126. So it, it's a little complicated. But it gives you the rough idea. If in fact the mass measurement is wrong, the mass should really be over here, well then the signal strength will change a little bit too. Not simply a matter of counting the number of them. Uh, this is one sigma, one standard deviation. A complicated shape. This is two standard deviations. Um, so on this plot, one of the things that you can see by eye is that we are within two standard deviations of the standard model. Again, remember the standard model is not known precisely, and that's incorporated into this error bar already. So this error bar includes the fact that there's theoretical uncertainty on how big the cross-section is for production of the Higgs. Because this process is only known to 15%, even though it's been calculated to next to next leading water, and only went to weak corrections are in so. <clears throat> but notice that it's a lot more than three sigma away from zero. They have discovered it. It's there. And they discovered it in this experiment, and they discovered it in this experiment. But this experiment, you know, doesn't have quite the same level of evidence as this one does. It's just chance. We ran this process many, many times. Sometimes one experiment gets lucky and gets a few extra events. If an experiment gets unlucky, gets a few, gets fewer events. And as we saw last time, CMS, depending on how they do the analysis, has actually seen some fluctuations, which, again, that can happen. You know, data fluctuates. The only difference between Atlas and CMS is that at CMS, the data fluctuates up and down, and that Atlas fluctuates left to right. That's a joke, I believe. Anyway. Um, here, of course, you only see the one sigma error bars. This is still probably five sigma away from zero, but just barely. Again, five standard deviations is considered the gold standard as to whether you discovered something. One thing you should remember is that in July, an experiment can tell you we have 5.2 sigma. And in December, they can tell you actually we only have 4.6 because the data fluctuated. It's not monotonic necessarily. That's one important thing. The other thing is that they tell you we have 5.2 standard de deviations away from zero. Well, but if they do the analysis a little bit differently, they'll have four point nine. Or if they make a certain set of cuts a little bit different, they choose a slightly different set of events, they analyze with a slightly different statistical method, they include an effect or they don't include an effect, they make some choices about what they think their systematic errors are, 5.2 maybe becomes 5.4, becomes 6. There's nothing magical in that number 5, because the actual standard deviations away from 0 that they have depends on how they did the analysis. It's not some fixed number. There's no... The, the, the process of determining what your, what your uncertainties are is part science and part art and part choice. So, don't take it too seriously. Take it with the right amount of seriousness. So what does that mean? Well, if they tell you something is only two sigma, it doesn't matter if it's 1.6 or 2.3, it's not very significant. 
If they tell you it's 10 sigma, it doesn't matter if it's 9 or if it's 11. That's pretty, that's pretty simple. When you're in the 3 to 5 range, you need to pay attention to whether you believe them or not. And it doesn't really matter if they say 5.2 or 4.8. Because there's an error bar, if you like, on the uncertainty, which is just a matter of, which you can't quantify. It. You just can't take it that seriously. So, of course, when, you, you know, when someone says, okay, our gold standard is 5.0, this is very much a human statement. This is not a statement about science. It's a statement of humans like round numbers. There's nothing magical about 5. But you will see, the experiments will always somehow manage to get 5. Not 4.9. Which tells you, they're human beings, and they make the little adjustments they need around the edges to make sure they get 5. And not 4.9. Because you can do that. It's a human process. And you, sh you could be sure there's no way that Atlas is going to come out with 5.1 and CMS is going to come out with 4.8. That's just not going to happen. So, this is all to say that you have to be very careful. So, back in, in December of 2011, both experiments had hint that they might be seeing this problem. And one experiment sort of had 2.8, and the other had, well, you have to combine a few things, but maybe they had 2. Point. And then all sorts of people went out and combined the two experiments. And said, well, they're not combining their results, but we can. We can do the statistical analysis. Wow, it's already four sigma. We're getting there. Ignoring the fact there's a tremendous amount of bias between the two experiments. They're not uncorrelated. They should be. But if one experiment's about to make a discovery, the other experiment is not going to say we don't see anything, unless they really see nothing. Unless they're sure they see nothing. If they see a little bit of a hint, they're going to give you an argument that, yeah, like, we see a pretty good hint. Because if it turns out that, well, it wasn't really there, at least they're both wrong. But you sure as heck don't want to be the one that didn't discover anything. Is bias. You just ignore it. Furthermore, in principle, what's going on in this experiment doesn't know what's going on in that experiment. But in practice, there are people who used to be on this experiment who are now on that experiment, and their accounts were never properly canceled, so they still can see what's going on in the other experiment. And although they should not look, because it should, they should understand. The best experiments do understand this. That you should never look at your uh, at your competitor's data, because you can only be sure you're getting an accurate measure if you are unbiased. Greatest degree possible. But you know, some student who doesn't really understand this yet will go and look over here and there's some pub stock who then spreads the rumor and suddenly everybody knows that Atlas sees a hint of something. And now CMS is not going to do an unbiased experiment. It can't. Best as they try. So these sociological things influence results. And you can't be naive about this. By now, it doesn't matter. Okay, this is discovered. But when you ask what's the mass, when you ask does this agree with the standard model precisely or not, now the process starts again. If one experiment says we think things disagree with the standard model, and the other experiment says we think things do agree, well, you're going to have to make some decisions about what you believe and why. And just because one experiment says, sees, maybe says someday we see a three sigma deviation, 3.2, Okay, you're going to have to start looking at these numbers and decide for yourself. <laughs> and the whole point about statistical analysis is that by the time you're sure that you found something, these numbers don't matter. We don't really care how many sigmas it is known that the z boson exists, right? Maybe it's a million sigma? Who cares? It's only in this transition zone between a lack of knowledge and knowledge that you're trying to follow these numbers. And really, to my mind, what's most important about them is, are they increasing or decreasing over time? It's not exactly where they are, because that's a bit arbitrary. But you want to know, was last year's two and a half standard deviation from the standard model, did that become four sigma, or did it stay at two and a half or two? Because if you got more data and the deviation did not become more significant, then it's probably not really there. Certainly, it's not as big as they originally thought. So, it's really the trends. It's not the precise value of the number of standard deviations, but it isn't getting bigger or small. And don't get too worried about exactly 5.1 or 
Um, there's a lot more to say about statistics. I mean, I'm not a statistics expert, I'm not going to give you a course in it, but again, just qualitative things about it. We'll say a few more as we go through. Are there any questions that are raised by this homily? Let's go on for a bit. So, um, last time we stopped in the middle of taking a little bit more uh, of a look at W productions. And um, let me just put a couple of formulas on the board for you, which I, I last, not, last time I sort of said things in words. But we can put the numbers behind this. So, um, obviously, if you have something like Z boson or K, we've seen the, all of the particles in the final state. Z goes to be mu, Z goes to be gamma gamma. You can reconstruct the mass of the particle that decayed because of energy momentum conservation, and the mass of the particle is just, you just take the objects in the final state, you add their formal momentum to square, and that gives you the mass squared, the, uh, the invariant mass squared of the whole system, which of course, therefore, the square root of that is just the mass of the particle you started with. With two caveats, one of them is that particles have widths. In the case of the Higgs, it's too, way too small to observe, but in the case of the Z, it's, uh, it's not true. That you can actually observe, and you, you'll see in the shape. Um, there is some experimental uncertainty in any measurement, and that depends on how well you measure these particles. In this case, it's order one percent. So these are these are comparable, close enough that you have to actually add them in quadrature to understand the shape of the z boats and it's measured in these experiments. When you're measuring muons, electrons, and photons, the uncertainties tend to be in the one two percent range. It depends on the momentum. That's a complicated story. You're measuring jets, 5%, 3%, 5%, it becomes a lot more difficult to measure the momentum because jets are more complicated. And they fluctuate more from one jet to the next, well, not the same. Sometimes you have a lot of hadrons, sometimes you have a few hadrons. Sometimes the hadrons are all charged, sometimes they're mostly neutral. Depending on those details, you make the measurement differently, and therefore, the same quark fired 100 times, you give you 100 different jets, and they will have slightly different energies as measured in the detector. So you won't get quite a sharp peak from a particle that goes into jets. And on top of that, you have lots of jets with big backgrounds. All right, for Ws and for many other measurements, we're missing particles. We don't get to see the neutrinos. So uh, the W is fairly simple. Um, as I emphasized last time, you produce the W potentially moving, the Q2 bar collision. If you make the W, it's heading this way, and then it decays to a muon, an neutrino that you don't observe. But you know that the transverse momentum of the muon in the lab frame is the same as the transverse momentum of the muon in the W frame, if the W is moving along the beam And you know that you know, the, the muon can only go out in, from 0 to pi in, in theta, and the maximum PT it can have is if it goes out at pi over 2, uh, in which case its PT is just MW over 2. We can do better than that. I drew a shape for you. I said, well, that means well, we should see something like this. But I didn't tell you why you see this shape for the PT of the muon or the electron uh, and the number of events for W production. The reason is the following. Um, the W is produced more or less unpolarized, let's say. Quite true, close enough. So, in the rest frame, the muon or electron may go up in a roughly spherical distribution. So you know the angular distribution there, and now we just convert from a flat distribution in cosine theta, in cosine theta in the center mass frame of the partons where the W is produced. So in the W mass frame, it's spherically symmetric. And now we just convert that differential cross-section, which is flat, in cosine of theta in the center mass, to uh, one that involves um, to, a, to, a, to a differential distribution of PT. So the differential distribution of PT is the differential distribution in cosine uh, theta center mass, which is constant, times this differential. PT is the W mass time over 2 times the sine of the angle in the center mass frame. And this differential is just the tangent, and then you rewrite that terms of PT in the W mass, you get this, and that is this distribution of plot. Uh, the PT goes up, and then it has to cut off when PT is equal to exactly uh, 
this value. And so that's why we see uh, something that looks roughly like this, and then there are two effects which broaden this. One, well, three effects, really. One is if you don't measure the momentum of the electron perfectly. This is, by the way, the transverse energy. That's the same as the transverse momentum. It's just a different language. It's, um, uh, so, so first, we don't measure it perfectly, but that's a, that's a small effect, 1%-ish. Uh, second effect is that the W is width. That's a couple of GV. And then the third, third effect, the most important, is that the W is not necessarily produced at rest along the B pipe. There's a probability that it recoils against the jet, and the PG distribution of the W therefore spreads out the electron momentum. But the basic shape you can understand. Okay, notice this is a linear plot. Remember, we also keep track of what we're looking at linear plot or a log plot. There are a couple of backgrounds down here which are pretty small. One of them is from some jet event where something weird happens and it looks like you have an electron and, and, and missing energy. That's pretty weird. It doesn't happen very often, but it's not completely negligible. Right? Down here, it's a, you know, a, few, a few percent of the events in this region. And then here is W goes to Townu. Sometimes, I mean, W can go to Townu as often as it goes to Enu. And then Townu can go to an electron. One fifth of the time, seventeen percent, more precise. So you expect to see some W goes to town to where the tau goes to an electron, and that gives you a little contribution down here. All those have to be included. And notice this this solid line is a prediction, and not to the data. So it works pretty well. But there's a lot that goes into this prediction, uh, which we'll come back to. Um, it doesn't come out of the box as perfect as that, it's a little bit of work. Now, a variable which turns out to be better for many purposes and is sort of comparable to measuring the mass of the Z is what's known as the transverse mass. Transverse mass, you can think of in the following way. We don't know something about this event. We don't know the Z component of the neutrino momentum. But we know everything else. So how might we analyze this event? What we can do is we can effectively project it to two plus one dimensions. So imagine just the way we do in these pictures, the event displays, we give you a two-dimensional view of the event. We just give you the two-dimensional view of the event. You try to analyze it using Lorentz kinematics in two plus one dimensions. This is what's called transverse mass. So we define an electron momentum, a free momentum, which is equal to the electrons, um, uh, sorry, uh, where you take the electron's transverse momentum, so that's the momentum in the x and y directions, and you define sort of a two-dimensional energy, which is just the output value. And similarly, you define a neutrino momentum, you're not really sure it's a neutrino, but in a similar way, you take the missing transverse momentum that you measure, that's a vector, and then you take the output value of that. And these are all things you know. And now we take the square of these as though they were in three dimensions. Sorry, in two plus one dimensions. And um, so that dot product uh, is you know, just what you would do in, in three plus one dimensions if you do all the information. And the one thing that's for sure is that because you've left out what's going on in the z direction, this is less than or equal to the w okay. So you expect something goes up in a similar way and crashes down in the Now, um, of course, it doesn't crash down as tight as you'd like. It does a little better than it looks. It's a little hard to see here because there's zero is suppressed. Right? Zero is down here in this plot. And so you can see how wide this, um, this drop-off is. And zero is down here on this plot. So this drop-off is not quite as wide as it looks. The percentage-wise, percentage this is actually better. And one of the reasons is, that if the W actually is kicked sideways in the event, if you've got the W moving this way, and let's say some sort of quark with gluon which floats against the beginning of the jet, this is, since it's Lorentz invariant in two plus one dimensions, it doesn't 
uh, care if the W picks up a boost to at least leading order. So the endpoint is not particularly sensitive to the motion of the W. And that's one of the reasons people like it. Unlike this one, the electron PT, which really does depend on whether the W is moving, this one, because it's effectively 2 plus 1 dimensional Renson variant, doesn't care as much. In particular, you pick up, you hit this endpoint. Why do you hit this endpoint? You would hit this endpoint for those events where the W produces a muon and a neutrino that really are just moving in the x and y directions. Right? Or a boost of that. And so all I'm telling you is that's precisely the case. You hit this equality precisely for events that really are just 2 plus 1 dimensional anyway. And so now if I boost them, in a boost of W in some direction, I really do not change the value of this uh, quantity. So this is why this transverse mass quantity is used a great deal uh, in these experiments. And so, again, there is some slop here. Partly due to the measurement error, partly due to the W width, and partly due to the fact that transverse mass is not literally the rest of there. And so there is some flaw. But again, as you can see, you can predict this. And so therefore, you can use this to measure the W max in the same way you can measure the Z max by looking at the peak and looking at the peak sets, so looking correct for all sorts of things. Well here, by fitting this distribution, and again the data is, in, is black dots and lines combined with these two are some sort of prediction, this can be used to measure the W max. In fact, I expect to measure the W max very accurately this <coughs> to better than percent. Much better than a percent eventually. But they'll pick special effects to do that. So we can look, just as we look for resonances, we can look for new particles, new W like particles that produce an electron and or muon or something else, photon, and missing energy at much higher mass than we've never looked before. We can look for them by looking for structures like this one. Maybe a very small structure, like the Higgs is a very small resonance. Well, maybe we're looking for a very small edge. But we can look for such things. And people do. Okay, any questions? So, this is preamble to, let's say, the next measurement one would like to do uh, in the case of the Higgs. So, um, well, let me make a remark actually before we do that. Um, we'll go back. This is something I could have said earlier. Um, what have we actually measured here? Well, we've measured each one of these measurements is a measurement not of a production of cross section or of a branch fraction, but of a product of the two. Right? That's always the case. We'd like to know, because we're interested in how the Higgs couples to other particles. We'd like to know this coupling, this coupling, this coupling, but we never measure them separately. We're always measuring the production this way times the decay that way, or something like that. So it's always the product appears. So the easiest thing to measure is ratios of coupling. For example, if the Higgs is predominantly being produced this way, as is the case with these two measurements, we've measured the product of this production times this branch fraction, and the, this product times that branch fraction. So the ratio of those two gives us the ratio of the couplings to W, sorry, the couplings of the Higgs to the Z, versus the coupling of the Higgs to two photons. So, one of the first things we can do is we can ask, first of all, does that, does that ratio agree with the scalar model? And second of all, what are we actually measuring when we measure that ratio? So, as I, I've mentioned, I've emphasized before, um, well, first of all, this coupling is narrow. That's the coupling of W or the Z to, to the fermions. We know that. This coupling is the very important coupling that tests whether the Higgs really does give mass to these particles or not. So we really want to measure that check. Whereas the Higgs goes to photons is more complicated. 
because it involves the coupling to the W again, and the coupling to the top. Really more sensitive to the coupling to the W. But still, this ratio is a complicated test, a significant test, of all structure in the standard model, as far as the Higgs is concerned. Because it can be mass the things it's supposed to. So, um, and you can ask, all right, we've discovered a part of it, but do you think it's really a Higgs boson? What makes you think it's a Higgs? After I get to some other scalar, it's easy to come up with some other scalar that couples to gluons. Right, just let's, um, <clears throat> let's imagine I have some, some, some scalar phi. Let's imagine it doesn't carry any standard model quantum numbers at all. It's not an SU2, it doesn't come from an SU2 dump, it doesn't give mass anything, just some scale. Alright, and I'll add some colored particles, C. Because color and charge. Now, just by telling you that, I already know that I can have this loop. And I can have this loop. And in fact, I can put C's here too. Why? Well, if C carries charge, that means it carries hypercharge. It might carry SU2, it might not, so I don't know what it costs the W's. If it does carry SU2, then it also comes a couple of W's. So now I have a, I have a particle that couples to photons, the gluons, the Z's. You sure this is an Higgs? Well, you better check it. What's the evidence? Okay. Well, production by itself doesn't tell you anything. That's perfectly well allowed for any scale that carries the cost of some colored part to be produced in blue. And the decay of photons tells you nothing. Now, of course, the fact that the product of the production times this decay happens to come out pretty close to what the standard model predicted, that's pretty suggestive, but not convincing. And similarly, just the fact that I have blue blue and I have a final state with two z's, one z on show, one z off show, is also not convincing. Same argument. But this loop gives you contributions to gamma gamma and to zz that are related to each other. And they're dimension five operators. Right? In particular, this operator, the operator that we get from loops like this, has the form phi, in the case of gluons, would be g mu nu, g mu nu. And there's some mass scale. Okay, that mass is typically the mass of the particle here, um, just by dimensional analysis, this is going to be some sort of alpha s, it's probably some more pi. Here we'll get something like alpha over 4 pi f c, phi f mu nu. This is just basically looking, counting the number of power of two electromagnetic couplings, so that it gives me an alpha. We need a mass scale, the only mass scale of the problem is the mass of this particle out here. The 4 pi is, you have to think about how many pi there are. It's a loop graph, so there's a 16 pi squared. I put one 4 pi here, I absorb the other 4 pi into my definition. And it is some number, which is the word Probably not nothing. Alright, but the point is that actually this is not the right statement. The right statement is I should have alpha for hypercharge, and this F mu nu should be the gauge field strength for hypercharge, not for the photon. Because we're working at scales, this charge, this particle up here by assumption is too heavy for us to produce the effect. Not when we've seen it. If it's 150 GB, we would know it exists. So it's some heavy particle, 300, 500, 800 GB. So from its point of view, SU2 cross U1 isn't even broken. It's barely broken. So the photon and the Z, or, you know, the Z mass is not very important. The photon and the Z just combine together. This is just the hypercharge photon here. So there's a hypercharge, which appears here. And this FB nu involves hypercharge. And so it's not some amount cosine theta w, theta weak, 
uh, of the photon and some amount of the z. Given 
how large the rate was per gallon gamma. So this ratio is a very important ratio in convincing us that we've got it. It's not the only ratio we can measure. But are there any questions about this one? Okay, but well one of the other things that's determined for you, this is really the mechanism of molecular symmetry break, is the relation between the coupling to the double and the coupling to the Z. I mean, that, those couplings, the, the, this, you, know, you have exactly the same coupling here with the W's, and the only thing that's slightly different is, well, the mass. So there's a, perhaps there's a determinable ratio, which has something to do with the ratio of the Z mass and the W mass. So this is a determinable ratio of the couplings, which then you have to do a little calculation to work out the ratios. And accounting for the fact that the W is complex and C is real, and accounting for the fact that the W, because it's lighter, is not quite as far off shell as the Z, the rate for the Higgs at this mass to go to WW is, let's see, that's about uh, 3%, this is about 20%. So roughly speaking, it's, it's several times larger than the Higgs to go to CC star, so there's a prediction. And in fact, the Higgs to K to WW star is a large rate. So why didn't we discover it that way? What makes that hard? Neutrinos. Well, you might have asked me already, in Higgs goes to ZZ star, why did I look at four leptons? Z can also go to quark pairs, and it can quark anti quark pairs, and go to neutrino anti neutrino pairs. But for those neutrino anti neutrino pairs, I don't know where the neutrinos went, so that's not very useful. I can't reconstruct. I can still look for those events, they're still interesting, but I'm not going to be able to make a nice plot which is nice and flat with a bump on it, because I'm not going to be able to reconstruct the mass of the Higgs, since I haven't measured all the particles in the final state. Another possibility is that Higgs goes to ZZ star, I can get, four, uh, I can get two parts and two antiparts. We have jets, the four jets that I would get in that, in that situation, first of all, a huge background, much larger than for the four leptons. And second of all, I don't measure them that well. So the resolution is poor. So I'm looking, instead of a, a, a very narrow bump on a very small background, I'll be looking for a very broad bump on a huge background. Hopeless. So the same is true for WW star. WW star can give us four jets, useless. Could give us one lepton, one neutrino, and two jets. Not great. And give us two leptons, a lepton and anti lepton, I should say, a neutrino and an anti neutrino. But in that case, we're missing two particles. So we're not going to be able to reconstruct the Higgs as a bomb. We're going to have to look for it as a shape, some sort of um, some sort of shape that's probably going to be kind of more complicated than the way we look for the W as a shape. goes to W, W star, we have a lepton, and a neutrino, uh, and an anti-lepton and anti-neutrino. So we're looking for events that have an electron and a positron, or an electron and an anti-muon, or a muon and an anti-muon, plus some missing transverse momentum, which gives us evidence of at least one, presumably more, neutrinos. And we're going to have to do some real work. It's not going to just sit, sit there. It's a nice bump where we're going to have, you know, it's great when you have a background and you've got a bump on it. Okay, right? You just draw a line from it, you see a bump. Well, that's not going to work. Both because this distribution is going to have some funny shape we have to model. And because the backgrounds are big. Not so big as to make the measurement impossible. Big enough you have to deal with it very carefully. So in particular, the background that's going to be most dangerous is going to be proton, proton, goes to WW. How do you make Ws? How do you make a pair of Ws? What's the 
obvious interest rate, QQ bar, right? Um, so let's let's just draw the graph so we're all on the same page. Um, all right, so one thing we gotta worry about is QQ bar goes to a Z or a photon and then to a W plus and a W minus. And actually this interferes with this graph. So those, that's one amplitude you have to calculate. This is not the only way to make a W plus and a W minus higher. Here's another. It's a loop graph. It's not negligible. It's not negligible because there are lots of new ones in the initial state, more than and because there are a lot of parts which can go around in this loop, and they all add up. So this is not a negligible effect. It's not cute, but it has to be put in. Um, one of the things that's very important here is that this W plus W minus are in a spin one state, and here they're making it in a spin zero state, and it turns out that since the Higgs is in a spin zero state, it actually contributes a larger fraction to the region where the Higgs is sitting than its pure fraction of the total WW direction. So this is not, this is something you can't ignore. Excuse me. Yeah. And if the physical boson that we measure is a mix in between the Higgs boson and another scalar field, we can only infer this by looking at the absolute cross section, no? Will you, will you let me come back to that question and tell me that? It's something there. The issue is, well, what if we're not dealing with the standard model? We do have to talk about that, obviously. It's one of the main things we're trying to test out in the next few years. So I will basically carry it. Let's now, for the moment, just assume we're trying to see whether the standard model is right, but we will get back to these uh, details, details later. All right, so, we, so what do we do? We take the definition of the transverse mass. I give you transverse mass when I have one electron and missing energy. Now I have a lepton and anti-lepton and missing energy. So again, I form some sort of two plus one dimensional invariant mass, maybe two leptons and the missing energy, which involves the two neutrinos. I don't know how much energy one neutrino carries versus the other, but I just add them all together. I create this transverse mass, and I get uh, a lack of distribution. So it's like this. This is not the only distribution I make. I make lots and lots of shapes. Um, there's um, <coughs> my look at the angle between the two, between the electron and uh, the electron, the electron and the electron. We might look at the um, uh, the invariant, uh, the invariant mass of the two, or we might look at uh, other properties. So there's maybe six or seven distributions we might make, and then we try to do some very complicated fit to determine whether the data looks more like. Uh, what we expect from the standard model without the Higgs being there versus what we expect from the standard model with the Higgs being there. And every one of those plots looks something vaguely like this. So let's take a look. It's all all, they're all different in detail. I picked this one almost at random and I'm not sure that was such a great idea. But let's take a look at, at what's in it. First of all, a subtlety. These are events in which, in addition to the electron and the muon, which are studied here, they, 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 oh, I should have, no, it's fine. Um, often people study a case where you just have an electron and an anti-muon, or a muon and an anti-electron. Why is that? It's a little simple, because if you have an electron and an anti-electron, or a muon and an anti-muon, you have another background, which might come, let's say, from, uh, Z, Z, let's put a gamma Z or a gamma star here, where I produce a lepton and an anti lepton, and I have a Z here that decays to neutrinos. It's another background. It's not a background with W's, but it's a background with the same quantum state. On the other hand, these two leptons have the same flavor. They're either both electrons or both muons. So in this plot, I don't have this background. However, I sure have a heck of a lot of other backgrounds. Look at all this. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six different colors on this graph. Each one corresponding to a different background. And none of them 
except maybe the green one, completely negligible. Another subtlety is that these are events that contain either no jets or one jet. Right, so um, we measure lepton, anti-lepton, some neutrinos, and we demand there be at most one additional jet. Now, okay, now I have to go read the paper. Because what's a jet? And how much momentum was that jet required to have? I mean, there's always something you can call a jet. So presumably this is no, at most one jet with PT above something, 20 G, 25 GB. We have to go read the paper to find out, it's not clear in the graph. But they're allowing one jet, and that's important for understanding why some of these uh, backgrounds appear. Okay, so what are all these backgrounds? Well, the biggest one, Again, this is, this is not a log plot, right? So what you see is what you get. The areas really correspond to the size of the background. The largest background is WW. Okay, and it has a little bit of structure here, um, which is in the um, 120 to 140 GB range. It's a little weird. But it has to do with the fact that the W goes on shell around 100, and the W pair goes on shell around 160. Right, the mass of the W is, is 80. So at 160, if you really calculate the mass, you start seeing WW pair production being direct. Right down here, it's WW star, and up here it would be WW. But it's complicated now, so we've got the neutrinos. So the transverse mass is not a measure of the mass of the two Ws. Still, there's some structure here. So that's why it's this weird shape. So unfortunately, as a, well, it's what it is. Um, we'll have to talk about how they got that shape in a second. This is the dominant background, but not the only one. Look at this green one. It's not very important, but, well, actually, before I do that, look at this red one. This red one is not, quote, stacked. That is to say, these backgrounds are one on top of another. This one is just plotted here, so you can see it on its own. And then it's stacked up here. This one is what you expect from a standard model case of 125 GB. Okay, and the red line up here is what you expect when you take all the backgrounds and you add this to them. Okay, so in the end, we're going to compare the red line with the data. And compare it to the purple, which is everything without the hexagon. Alright, well, what is this background down here? So this is green. This is Drellian plus Jets. That's this one. Wait a second, I thought I told you that there wasn't any back. Why does this come in? What's the sum? I've got an electron and a neutron. How can I get that from a C? Let's see, the Z to plus and minus, the Z to plus and minus. What else? Z to case of neutrinos, the case of towns, the case of quarks. You have to get to two doubles. What happens if you decay the two taus? What does the tau decay to? Tau can decay to electron plus neutrinos, or it can decay to muon plus neutrinos, or it can decay to hat box. So a tau tau event, z goes to the tau tau, and give me one electron and one muon. With relatively low momentum, because a lot of momentum goes into the neutrinos in the tau. Tau. So it ends up down here at relatively low, uh, and, and sort of on the low side. There is a contribution, not huge, but it's there. And it's it's relevant because it's down here you find the Higgs too. You've got to account for that. Alright, what's this yellow one? Top. Top? How did the top part come in? What does the top decay? Two dominoes which go through. But what is it? What is a single? What is just one top part decay to? Okay, good. So a top part decays to W plus B. And the cross section is big, right? So then that gives us a W and a B. Alright, well, 
Now I get, I have two Ws. I have two jets, but maybe one of them has a little fatigue, the one goes down the B part, the one is reconstructed for some reason, you lose it. Just because I've got two quarks in my Feynman graph does not mean I observe two jets. They might just be on top of each other, by chance. Or one might be very low away. So this contributes, and it contributes in a significant way. It's as big as our signal. You better model that correctly. You make a factor of two mistake in this, you think you have something you don't. So this is complicated. We have to correctly model how often does a top part, which gives us two W's and two B's, result in a measurement of only one jet above some particular value of the PT. If we model that incorrectly, we cannot do the measurement. Similarly, I didn't say it, but it's also true. Here, we have to be able to correctly model how often do we get W plus zero jets, plus one jet, or plus two jets, three jets, for this particular value of the PT that I've chosen as the separation between a jet that I count and a jet that I don't count. That's a complicated QCD calculation. If I don't do that correctly, make a few percent mistake down here, well, my signal can't be seen. This is where at least some theorists are in their key. These are not easy calculations to do, and they can put it to some simulation package so that the experimenters can actually extrapolate so they're actually observed. Uh, all right, the next one. This is W plus jets. Why do we have single W plus jets down here? That's the gray one. What's going on there? One fake lepton and one real one. Okay, so we have some event in which we produce a single W. Okay, and we produce maybe a couple more jets. And one of those jets fragments very strangely, and I get a fake, well, let's say, oh, there's actually a new one in there, but the rest of the jet kind of disappeared. So it's a fake, isolated new one. It's a real new one, but it should have been inside the jet. But it's not. Or I have a jet that fragments in some strange way, so the only thing I get is one pion that's charged, and one pion that's neutral. And the pion that's neutral gives me two photons, and the pion that's charged gives me a track, and a track that points at some electromagnetic energy is called an electron, whether it's an electron or not. So I get a fake electron. It doesn't happen very often, but W plus jets is a big factor. You have to calculate that and look, why didn't you, why didn't you know? It's the same size of your signal, it sits in the same place. You screw that up and no measurement. And finally, we have this guy. What's that? W gamma star. How can W gamma star give me this guy? Well, um, so I make my W, that gives me a real lepton. I make a photon either, well, let's, let's say what, what, what's actually most likely and most problematic turns out to be I make a jet, and the W, which is charged, radiates a relatively low amount of photon, which is just a little bit off shell, and that goes to a lepton anti lepton pair. So now it looks like I have three leptons, right? One from the W and one lepton and two lepton pair from, from the off-shell photon. And then, what happens? I missed the lepton. I missed one of the leptons. Lepton one of the leptons happens by chance at very low amount. So low that I don't observe it. And what do you know? It's the same shape and it sits in the same dark place as the signal. And you know something? Back in July 2011, both experiments, I was at the, was at the Grenoble conference, and both experiments reported a hint of a Higgs maybe somewhere in the 140 GeV range. And then it quietly disappeared. Because they had both, both experiments had left this out. So 
I was in the Monte Carlos. Nobody, no, no theorist, no experiment had thought of that background. And in fact, the reason this background was discovered was because people were looking, were, were studying the backgrounds to three lepton events and four lepton events and discovered the Z boson decaying to three leptons. How does the Z boson decay to three leptons? Well, you learned yesterday how it decays to four leptons. Now you just miss one of those leptons because it's very low momentum and you get three. And so at some point, one of my colleagues hit himself in the head and said, but then you can get a W, then you can get a W event which has just two. A W young star event has just two. And it's the right size and the right shape. So every single one of these has to be modeled very carefully, checked against other measurements, and then, and only then, can you try to make a comparison to see if there's anything else. Very difficult measurement. You can imagine if someone had claimed they had discovered the Higgs based on this measurement, uh, there would have been a lot of discussion about whether you believe that. This is very difficult. Um, I don't know how much to trust this sort of measurement. It's pretty good. You can see a couple of effects of the difficulty of this measurement. These dashed lines, which you see here, can you see them? They're, they're these cross hatches. So this red line is what the prediction from all these backgrounds plus the Higgs should be. But this dashed area is showing you how large the systematic error is believed to be on this prediction. And that's all coming from not really knowing each of these backgrounds well enough. And it's a pretty big systematic error. And these are not uncorrelated errors. It might be that some of these, some of these backgrounds are wrong. They should be normalized larger or smaller. And so they don't just affect one bin, they might affect the whole shape. It's quite a tricky visit to analyze what's going on in this plot and understand what these errors mean. In fact, there's can't really do it just in this plot alone. So, what's the bottom line? The bottom line is they do see an excess consistent with the W, with Higgs goes to WW. And it is, you know, of the right size, and, and it's looking pretty good. But this is the kind of thing that you use once you have confidence that this thing is already there and already that it's mass. It's pretty hard to make a zero. They tried very hard. In the end, this measurement made very little contribution to the discovery at all, even though it's the first measurement you could make. Because there's a lot of data here. Right? There's a lot of events in these things. So 150 or so. And there were more for heavy Higgs masses because the Higgs goes to WW. But very tough. Right? Now, we need to talk a little bit about what goes into all of this predicting, because it's great when you're looking for a bump over a background you don't have to measure or predict. Sorry, you don't have to predict, you just measure. But most searches for new physics at the LHC, not all, most, involve some cocktail of backgrounds. And so we need to dig in and see how it's done, because someday if you want to make a prediction for one of these experiments, you're going to have to do this. It's not fun. And it's complicated. So let's learn a little bit about what goes on. Um, you have to understand this in part to kind of know what you can trust and what you can't. <coughs> so, here's somebody's cartoon of what goes into an LHC like proton proton collision. This is ignoring the issue of pileup, where you have multiple proton-proton collisions going at the same time, and how that can affect your measurements. Just one proton-proton collision. Okay, it happens to be written anti-proton here because this cartoon was made for the tevatron. It doesn't make any difference. So there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. First of all, if it's an event you're interested in, obviously, some parton hits some other parton in some very high-energy collision, and presumably some other partons came flying out. Or something. Meanwhile, <coughs> before these partons were created, before, sorry, before these partons collided, they could radiate. They could radiate gluons, quark-antiquark pairs, or something. 
So there is radiation from the initial spin, or ISR. And as these particles come out, if they carry color, they can radiate gluons, or quark-making quarks, or quark-making quark pairs. So there's final state radiation, or if this is electrically charged, it can radiate photons. That is sometimes important. Now, strictly speaking, if you think in terms of gauge invariance and Feynman diagrams, there is no strict separation between a gluon that's produced in initial state radiation and a gluon that's produced in final state radiation. They do interfere. So what do we mean when we say we're separating this? Does anybody have a sense for that? I mean, if I have a QQ bar, a pair production, with an extra jet, um, so let's say I have a um, And there's an extra jet that gets pr pr produced somehow, some blue one. Well, that can be radiated off of here. And then to that, I have to add the possibility that I radiate off uh, of here. And in fact, I really should even add the possibility that I radiated it off of here, right in the middle. And all those graphs have to be added together. It's fun, okay. So what does it mean to say, well, there's some initial state radiation and there's some final state radiation? This is really a question about Catani's numbers. What's the issue? They launch you from different directions. It has something to do with directions, right? Initial state radiation is presumably traveling somewhere near the beam point, relatively speaking. And final state radiation is presumably traveling somewhere near the part that's coming out over here. But why can I separate those? So, for example, if I have a particle that's coming out sort of in the direction of this part, what's the difference between the contribution of this graph, this graph, and this graph? There is a collinear enhancement. There's a large monomer in this graph. So, if we keep track of those things that are not merely alpha s corrections, but are alpha s times logarithm correction, therefore enhanced, and may in fact even have to be summed up in a summation, this is the argument. Similarly, for initial state radiation, this is the argument. And this doesn't get any of enhancement. You know, if I have an electron positron goes to mu and a to mu one, it's a little easier to think about, right? I mean, you know that there are going to be photons traveling with the electron and there are going to be photons traveling off of the mu one. And yes, they all interfere, but in practice, there's extra ones near, near the incoming guys and there's extra ones near the outgoing guys. That's what we're keeping track of. So, what's here is not a gauge invariant separation of things um, by, in, well, what, what's here is an attempt to make a separation into those things that are logarithmically enhanced, which we treat as initial state radiation and final state radiation, and those things that aren't enhanced, which we may try to include here, or we may just say, well, that's small enough, we don't have to worry about it. But we do have to include anything that has alpha s times log, because alpha s times log might be one, or half. Certainly not something you can deal with in perturbation. We have to do some recent measurements. Okay. So that's what we're and then on top of that, we have the remnants of the proton, of the two protons, which gives us the underlying bed. Now, if we are going to correctly predict the precision that you saw that we need, how likely is it that we're going to get n events with transverse mass of between 40 and 50 GeV from such and such a process? We have to model all of this with some level of accuracy. And that level of accuracy is definitely pretty good. Which is the part that you can calculate without even thinking about it? Well, it's hard enough for you may still have to think about it. You can, you can probably calculate the tree level contribution to this. But as you heard from, uh, as, as Katani pointed out and I pointed out two different ways, we said the same thing. The only result we'll get here is something proportional to alpha s to some power, because that's what a linear calculation will give you. And you don't know which alpha s to put in. And we saw how accurately you need these backgrounds. So alpha s 
let's say in the case of um, a process like this one, um, uh, no, we can go, let's take this one, I like this one, okay? We've got alpha S, so this is, this is a matrix element, right? So we have alpha S um, squared, once we square this. And then again, which alpha S? Should I put in alpha S evaluated at the top rock mass? Should I put it in evaluated at twice the top rock mass? Should I put it in evaluated at the center mass energy? Mass in W? I don't know. At the order, you don't know. And because alpha S is monotonic in mu, as you change mu, you can get any answer you want. Not all answers are reasonable, but certainly there's an error bar which is maybe a factor two. So you have to compute all the corrections, all the loop cut graph corrections, to get the top part production cross section right. Which of course people have done. But you better be careful. So that's not something you can do on a piece of paper. Already you're going to be using computer tools to do these calculations analytically, or even semi-analytically and semi-numerically. They're just too hard for uh, most of them are just too hard for, for a couple of humans sitting in a corner with, uh, with a piece of paper. Okay, so computers will help you calculate this. And so the first part of the calculation of the background involves the hard matrix element. There's the leading order part, and there's the next leading order part, and in some cases you'll be leading one over further. But this is a process where all the momenta coming in are high energy, and at least most of the momenta coming out are high energy. So maybe something like QQ goes to TT1. Gauge a variant process, it can be determined, it can be defined, it can be calculated um, with all the usual subtleties. What are the sub? Well, let's see. So, so the leading order calculation can be done using various automated tools that are easy to get hold. For example, one of the most famous is MadGraph. MadGraph will calculate leading order find the diagrams for you. There are many others. That's one of the easiest to use. No problem. Until very recently, And that's the new order calculation. Always was something that you needed, an, you needed to be an expert and work with a couple of experts and work for a long time. Sometimes it turns out that a next leading order calculation is basically very similar to leading order calculation times an overall normalization factor, which in some sense is just telling you what value of mu to put in the alpha s that you calculated. That's something that's what it is. How do you normalize this thing? Alpha S squared is what you get a leading order, and the next leading order calculation says, take alpha S squared at 2M top. That's going to give you the right normalization to the next order of factors. But that sort of assumes that the shape of the distributions in momenta of the next leading order calculation are pretty much the same as the other leading order calculation, and that's not always true. So the next leading order, you not only get the normalization right, but you may find that the shapes of distributions change too. And you may need that information for something like a background for, for uh, cases of The amazing thing is that this is becoming a problem. It's amazing because 10 years ago people would have said, maybe 30, 40 years from now, I'll figure it out. It was a revolution a few years ago, and it's taken care of a lot of us. Now, it works for some processes and not others, but eventually all these processes will be automated. So, in a sense, that's a solved, nearly solved problem, at least to this one. And that's great. Really terrific news. Um, okay, then we have to have some treatment of the initial sterilization files, <coughs> which involves summing up many processes. So, in particular, it's not just one emission you have to worry about, it's the second emission and the third emission. And um, maybe these guys radiate. In fact, the way this is done is to use Monte Carlo partners, which are specifically designed to deal with that. Pythia is an example. Herbig is another. These are programs which can take a hard part, well, maybe many things, but one of the things that they will do is they will say, okay, you tell me that you've got some high energy quark, 
and I'll soup it up so it now turns into something you might see in the experiment. How is that done? Well, it's similar to what I discussed yesterday. So let's first look at, at an incoming quark. So, so supposing you tell me you wanted to count, actually, let's do an incoming quark. Let's say you told uh, MathRAF or its generalization you wanted to glue those to the top, um, and you send the calculation into Pythia, and Pythia says, okay, so you've got some high energy gluon coming in, and it's going to do something in there. Where did it come from? It came from proton. It has some value of x. But it may not have come from a gluon on the proton. Or if it did, it may have come from some other gluon. Because now I'm going to try to follow it back in time and say, well, this could have been produced um, from a quark. It could be radiated by a quark. And before that quark was there, it could have radiated a gluon. And even before that, it could have been created from another one. <laughs> and this is the, what's happening here is you're sort of undoing the splitting process which Katani is talking about. You're working backwards to say, well, given that I have this blue one, which somebody told me this is the event I want to simulate, well, there's various things that may have come from. Maybe it come from a quark, an anti-quark, a blue one, with various probabilities, and I work backwards to figure out what they are, and I keep track of all the stuff that gets rated, because that's going to turn up in the machine. You can see that, right? Those particles are now carrying energy transfers to the beam. Some of them will actually turn into jets, and we'll see them. And it will do the same thing on the way out. Okay. Particle comes out. Again, you calculated that the momentum of the top is some number. Well, okay, uh, what happens next? Well, first of all, either Pythia or MagGraph has to remember the top part decays. The top part decays really fast. It decays on a time scale which is short. The top part never gets out of the proton during a collision. Barely. So it decays right away. So that's not complicated QCD. The top part decays the bottom part, W, maybe an extra gluon. Somebody's got to simulate that, but it's a perturbative calculation. All right, so really early on, our top part decays with the W, which is colorless, and then the W decays. Let's just assume to keep things simple. It goes to the left on the neutrino, so we don't have to keep track of its color. But then we've got a bottom line. Now this thing has high energy compared to its mass, right? It's, the top part has a high mass, so the bottom part comes out with a significant amount of energy, so it can radiate pretty easily. And so now we start keeping track. The right? gluon can radiate a gluon here, it can radiate a gluon there. This gluon can split the gluons, this gluon can split the quark and the quark pair, these guys can radiate. This is the shower, the perturbative showering process by which our quark turns into a jet of quarks and quarks and gluons. And Pythia will calculate this. It's, in fact, running almost the same splitting formulas as you use in Alfredo Parisi. Evolution of the parking distribution, the parking distribution functions. You just run them the other way. But you're even more careful about the product. And here we have to be careful in a way that you're not when you're doing algebraic Parisi. So when you're doing what, what, what algebraic Parisi splitting functions tell you to do, that Katani was describing to you, you're really trying to keep track of this parton only. Whereas here, you notice you're not just trying to keep track of this part, you have to keep track of all these other guys. Because they're going to show up in the detector. They're going to be part of your jet. Or maybe they're going to be outside your jet. And also, you have to keep track of these because they can radiate. And we don't care when we're doing what happens to these guys when we're doing just keeping track of part of the distribution function. But if you're simulating an event, this thing enters your detector. You have to know it forms a jet. How much is going on in that jet? It's a simulator. So, hit me up very cleverly and very, very carefully. Keep track of everything. Keeping track of all the large logarithms, everything that's enhanced by an alpha s times a log. It is far from obvious that this can be done, right? I mean, just I hand you the QCD with Ranjan and you tell me this is possible. This is a sort of classical statistical method, probabilistic method for calculating roughly what happens 
from a completely quantum mechanical theory. He is not obvious. Well, there are proofs that you can do this, but those proofs are, I mean, the people who prove this could be done. So why the credit, frankly? Can you imagine how much harder it would be if you could do this? Calculate everything somehow? Now, this is it amazing that the large logarithms can be organized in such a way that you can do sort of classical probabilistic reasoning that actually agrees with what the full quantum theory would tell you, up to some corrections, which is going to try some of them. Really non trivial statement about this is possible. And Pythia is making use of that. This is still the perturbative part. This was the part, right, this is the part that you calculate. This is the process, that is the hard process. Now we have the softer perturbative stuff, which we're really summing. And now, we have to get half right. Okay, well, I alluded to this last time. Pythia is going to have a do this too. They do it slightly differently. The concept's the same. So, I'm going to now say something I said last time, but more carefully, more theoretically, concrete. And keeping track of the fact that quark carries color, and anti-quark carries anti-color, and gluon carries color and anti-color. What I'm about to say is strictly true when the number of colors is large. But keep track of the fact that there are corrections of order one and one C squared. Ten percent corrections of one percent. All right. So we have our outgoing quark, our B quark, and it carries some color. And at some point, it radiated a gluon. And rather than drawing the blue line as a curly line, I'm going to draw it as a double line, indicating that it has anti-color and color. That's a blue line. Okay. And the thing about a blue line, of course, is that its color and anti-color are just like a quark-anti-quark -quark pair, except that unlike a quark-anti-quark -quark pair, which can separate in space, the blue line is a single object, so the color and anti-color can run together. And similarly, I may have another gluon back here, which then split to a pair of gluons. Uh, trying to make the arrows consistent. Let's see. It's out, it's in. Okay, so there's a gluon splitting to two gluons. Or I can have a gluon that split to a quark anti quark pair. Okay. The difference between a gluon and a quark anti quark pair isn't the number of arrows, it's whether the arrows are correlated in space or not. Right. This is a quark anti quark pair because this arrow is going off this way and that arrow is going off that way. Whereas here, they're locked together into a single okay. And now, eventually, this thing has to go all the way back to uh, the anti quark. Right? Somewhere out here, there's a key bar. And it's going off this way. This line, these lines just keep going. Right? There's, there's, there's gluons being rated, there's soft gluons being rated, then collinear gluons being rated. So these gluons are collinear, and then there's ones down here which are sort of soft and go in all directions. But they're all correlated in color. At least if this initial quark anti quark pair was a color single, which actually they're not, but let's, let, let's ignore that for a moment. I'll come back to that in a second. If these guys are color single, if this color and this color, this anti, this color and this anti color were initially correlated, then you've got this continuous line of color that flows all the way from all the gluons and all the antiquarks and quarks. Well, it can split as here if you have a quark antiquark pair. But at least where there are gluons, it just keeps flowing. Goes all the way. And in fact, the way to think about this is that this is a color diagram. I've got color going this way, and I have the same anticolor going that way. So it's just like an electron positron charge here, you have anti-charge there. This is a dipole. Here's a dipole, here's a dipole, here's a dipole, here's a dipole, here's a dipole. So I've got these chains of dipoles. What are these things? These are strings. Some abstract strings, but they are strings. They're strings of color. Right? Look at it, it's a string. It goes from here to there. Here's another one, goes from here to there. 
maybe after that. Just perturbation theory. This is why Toft tells you that gauge theory is related to string theory. It's because of the color correlations, which create these abstract strings that connect quark to the next to one, to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, to an anti quark, and then there's some other quark which again, carries you off to some other anti quark. Pythia is keeping track of this. It knows who is color correlated with who. Why? Well, first of all, it determines how things radiate, right? You know. And if I have a color dipole, sorry, if I have an electric dipole, if I have an electron going this way and a positron going that way, where are they going to radiate? Where will an electron going this way and a positron that going that way radiate a photon? And where won't they radiate? Okay. Okay. Let's put them really close together. Here comes, here comes an electron and a positron. From your point of view, standing very far away, it's neutral. It's not going to radiate out here. It can radiate inside. So there's a tendency in space for things to radiate literally between one particle and the other particle to which it is correlated on the particle. This helps determine the shape of jets. This is part of why jets are so colonized. Because particles tend to radiate in ways that are both correlated in space and in color. Okay, so it has to keep track of this. Part radiation pattern. And there's another reason to keep track, which is that eventually you get to the end of perturbation theory. The distance scales in this plot start to become of order the QCD scale. And that means the strong interactions become really strong, and hadronization begins to occur. Well, this is related to what I said the last time. If there were no light quarks in the game, then this string would extend unbroken from this end to that end. And there would be color forces all the way along this line, and this string would remain intact. This would be a color singlet object, and couldn't break very easily. And so it would tend to stretch out, and then eventually turn around and come back, and start swinging back and forth. It would be very complicated to model. No humans have a model. Very fortunately, what actually happens is as the, as the strong reactions get sufficiently strong, the probability for making quark and quark pairs gets pretty big. And you start producing a lot more of these quark anti quark pairs, which now start actually separating in physical space. So now my strings are no longer so long. So first of all, they're not so long in the sense they don't include so many particles, but second of all, they're not so long in physical space. This particle here is not moving that fast away from this one. So it's, there's a bunch, there's a quark over here, an anti-quark over here, a couple of blue ones in between, all at the scale of order maybe a, a GE or two in distance. And so this object is already a color sequence object ready to form a habit. And so Pythia says, probably this makes a habit. And now it has some random number generator and it says, well, maybe it's a bromance on it, maybe it's a couple of pions, or maybe it's, you know, depending on the flavor, if this is a strange part, maybe it's not, maybe this is a kale. So it goes through a process of creating habits. And it does so by having kept careful track of these strings, where they are in space, who's correlated with who, what makes a color signal, which you can now turn into a habit. Because all have bunch of color signals, by definition. Now some of those hadrons, like bromesons, are unstable. Or for example, if this is a B quark, one of the particles that comes out here is going to be a B mess. If he has to make sure all those things decay, so it's got this complicated table to make sure that everything decays to all the things that we know that decay to with the probabilities that we've measured in the extent we know that. Can you imagine how much work it was to put all this stuff in? And it has to constantly be updated because people make better measurements of the BMS of the K's. That's got to go back in the pithy. Harold and all the other people show. But it's needed. You can't do these measurements with that. You can't do measurements C plus and minus with that. So you can't do that. Okay? So, pithy is keeping track of 
If necessary, the case of the top part. Then, the showering and hydrization of all the quarks and gluons. Then, the formation of hadrons, which is completely non perturbative as opposed to this, which is perturbative. Calculate this. We know how it's supposed to happen. Here, you can't calculate what we put in everything we know from measurements about how hadrons are decaying. And we're guessing about how these complicated color streams form atoms. You fit that to data. We can't directly measure it. We can't calculate it. Right? It's not conservative. But we check. We do measurements at E plus E minus providers, which are relatively simple. We check to see if our models are okay. We adjust the models until they kind of agree with the data. It's phenomenological. It's not first principles. You can't calculate. Just measure what you can. And then all the decays of all the hadrons, which to some extent you can measure. And you follow that whole chain through, and you still haven't done the underlying event. But you've done everything else. Keeping track of the fact that sometimes, in fact, often in, in a machine like a hammer machine, the final state quarks are actually not in the color signal. Right? Look at this graph. In this case, is color octet going through the center. So actually, the color of this quark is tied to the color of that quark. So actually, the strings you're keeping track of may not just be strings of the final state, they may be strings that kind of link the initial state with the final state. Or to say it better, um, you're starting with a color singlet object called a proton, and another one. Right? And then by the time you're done, you may have a bottom part coming out, and the remnants of a proton. And these things are color correlated. Because this quark may have picked up the color of some initial state quark over here. And this color is anti-correlated with the, with the rest of the color in the proton. So that means this bottom part is correlated with, pro, with, with the remnants of this proton. It's not a proton anymore, right? It's all, so it's a sort of job. So if you keep track of that, your bottom part may actually be keeping color connected with the beam remnant. So Pythia knows where all that color is flowing, and it has to have some model for how all this stuff shatters into lots and lots of atoms. And again, you fit that to data. Because what else can you do in Cape Town? Without these tools, carefully tuned to earlier data and updated as necessary, keeping track of everything that goes on in the standard model. Calculating the hard matrix element as best you can, there is no way in the world that you can make a measurement like that. So do not underestimate the importance of these tools or how much physics goes into every single step. Some very smart people work very hard to make these things possible. They're vastly underappreciated. I hope at least the people who go for my classes will understand. There's an incredible amount of gauge theory and measurement and non perturbative as well as perturbative QCD going into every single step of this chain. Okay, what we will do next time is we'll finish with the Higgs, um, looking at the case of cows and bees. We'll talk a bit more about cows, bees, and cow crops in general. Um, and what I, then we'll start looking at various phenomena beyond the standard model. We'll also take a look, both on the theory side of what can happen, we'll also take a look at various experimental measurements and how they're actually done. Because I think we should, and I haven't decided which one, but we should go through one experimental paper. Because reading these things is hard. There's all sorts of elements. You should learn how to do it. So that's the mind.